Sunday school lesson. Uh, Joshua 21, verse 43 through 45, jumped out at me, and I realized if we all had this down pat, we wouldn't have any problems in our spiritual life. Let me read for you. If you don't know the Bible very much, Joshua is the sixth book over from the beginning. And chapter 20, uh, 21 says this, beginning in verse 43. And the Lord gave unto Israel all the land which he sware to give unto their fathers, and they possessed it and dwelt therein. And the Lord gave them rest round about according to all that he sware unto their fathers. And there stood not a man of all their enemies before them. The Lord delivered their enemies into their hand. And verse 45 says, There fell not aught of any good thing which the Lord had spoken unto the house of Israel. All came to pass. Isn't that wonderful? Amen. If we all understood that God, we this whole book we've been talking about, getting the promises of God fulfilled in our lives, and if we all understood that not anything God has promised has ever failed. Isn't that good? Yes. He Everything he promised us, it promised them, came to pass. Has God changed since the Old Testament time? No, he's the same. Uh, today, yesterday, and forever. Uh, and so if God hasn't changed, and he always fulfills his promises, what can you and I stand on? Amen. We know he's going to do what he told us he would do for us. Isn't that wonderful? That really helped me. I've had a good week. You know, it just takes one good verse or, or a couple of verses like that to make you have a good week. Don't you agree? It just really speaks to your heart and you just dwell on that. It gets you on the mountaintop and you stay up there a good while. I hope it won't, I won't come down today. Uh, don't don't make me come down. Please help me. Uh, look at the lesson as outline. This is really a good lesson also. Not because I put it together, but because God put it together. Uh, Joshua uh, 14, verses 1 through 5. Read those, please, with me. And these are the countries which the children of Israel inherited in the land of Canaan, which Eleazar the priest, and Joshua the son of Nun, and the heads of the fathers of the tribes of the children of Israel, distributed for inheritance to them. By lot was their inheritance, as the Lord commanded by the hand of Moses, for the nine tribes and the half tribe, you, under, you know that Reuben, Gad, and half the tribe of Manasseh stayed on the east side of the Jordan River. It didn't cross over into Canaan, and that's what he's talking about. For Moses had given the inheritance of two tribes and the half tribe on the other side of Jordan, but unto the Levites he gave none inheritance among them. The Levites had to live off what the people brought to the temple to sacrifice. Uh, for the children of Joseph were two tribes, Manasseh and Ephraim, and therefore they gave no part unto the Levites in the land save cities to dwell in with their suburbs for their or the cattle and for their substance. As the Lord commanded Moses, so the children of Israel did, and they divided the land. And this, this sums up what happened in chapters 11 through 22. We looked at chapter 11 last week, but they defeat the enemies. Uh, they take the land, and God gives to each tribe what he chooses. And they are content with what God gave them. Isn't that something? You know, if, if it was a typical group of Christians today, they would have been arguing about what God gave them instead of being satisfied with it. Uh, and we all need to learn to be satisfied with whatever God gives us. Now, in the Old Testament, God sometimes just makes a statement like this. And then in the New Testament, he expounds upon it and gives us more insight. And I put in the lesson here, uh, Philippians 4, 10 through 13. Paul said, But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly, that now at the last your care of me has flourished again, wherein you were also careful, but ye lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatever state I am therewith to be content. Yes. Isn't that a wonderful statement? Yes. If you can learn to be content, whatever state you're in, now that's talking about the state of existence where right around you, uh, when I went to New York to pastor for 20 years, <laughs> I had to learn this verse and, and do it. I did not want to go to New York. When I finished chaplain school, I told you my uh, one of my years in seminary, I went up there for nine weeks thinking I might serve with a weekend uh, unit. I never wanted to go full time, but I, I thought it'd be a good way to witness to men in National Guard on the weekend. 
And, and I finished nine weeks in Brooklyn at Army Chaplain School, and I still remember <coughs> driving off the island and saying, I thank you, God, I'll never have to be in this place again as long as I live. And then when, when our children got grown, we asked God to let us stay in at Lancaster, Pennsylvania, because it's such a wonderful place where our children grew up. And when they grew away, we said, Lord, if there's a place that's a little more difficult, we've had such a good ministry here, and you've been so kind to us, we're willing to go anywhere you send us. And listen, don't you say that to God unless you mean it. Because the first thing that happened was a pulpit committee from Long Island came to visit. And I was just as sure God called me there as I was any other of the churches I went to. Every church I've gone to, I felt God called me. I think God called me here. Yep. I, I, you yeah. ought to yeah. feel that way when you join a church. God put me here. God put me here in this place. Uh, and and But I, I did not want to be in New York. And you know what happened in 20 years? I fell in love with the place. Mm -hmm. I miss it still. Uh, I miss so much about it. The only thing I don't miss is having to go through New York City in order to get off Long Island. I did that over a hundred times in 20 years, and I never want to do that again. But what we're saying here, the state he's talking about here is not the, the state of the United States. He's talking about whatever condition you're in, physically, financially, whatever, you are content with what God has given you. That's what he's talking about here. And Paul said, uh, I know how to abound. I know how to be abased. And the word abased means to be in need or be humble. And I know how to abound. Uh, everywhere and in all things, I'm instructed both to be full and to be hungry, uh, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. In any situation you're in, if you ask the Lord, he'll give you the strength to not only endure it, but to find contentment in it and to find joy in the doing of it. He will do that. That's God's promise. Uh, and we live in a world that creates dissatisfaction. Our economy is based on making you dissatisfied with what you now have in material things. Uh, it, it's based on trying to get you to, to give up something you already have and buy something new. I don't know how you deal with that. Uh, I made up my mind years ago that when something comes out, it just looks like it will just revolutionize my life. I just know it'll make me the happiest person to ever lived on planet Earth. I wait at least six months before I buy it. And you know what happens in six months? I don't need it anymore. And, and beside that, by that time, there's been four or five more things I just must have to be happy introduced. Uh, just don't get caught up in that. That's, that's all done to make you unhappy with what you have. But it's also, a lot of the advertisement today is designed to make you unhappy with who you are as a person. You, you, you need to change. You need to, you need to exercise more. You need to do this. You need to do that. Uh, you need to buy this dress or this, this suit. You need to use this, uh, part of, of, uh, cosmetics or whatever in order to be a different person or you need to go somewhere you've never been before if you're going to be really be happy isn't that true that's that's what it's all designed for and god said some things that ought to help us here uh there are three principles here in this particular lesson i, I listed from what happened in the old testament first of all god's already given you everything you need to be happy He's already given you everything you need to be happy. And I'm talking about a God happy. That's joy. Happy in the world's connotation means everything is just perfect in my life. The birds are singing. The sunset's just beautiful. Everything's quiet. Nobody's bothering me. I'm just having the time of my life. That's not what joy is. Joy is you're in the middle of a traffic jam and sit there for two hours and you still have joy. That's, that's, that's God's kind of joy. And, and that you already have everything you need to be happy. First Timothy uh, chapter 6, 6 through 12 says, and, and I'm not going to read it all, it simply says that godliness with contentment is great gain. That is, it's the greatest gain because uh, Paul makes the, the, uh, makes a statement here that you, are, you brought nothing into this world and you will take nothing out of this world. And, and so because of that, uh, that we're talking about material things, 
you, you'll take nothing with you when you die. And because of that, the focus of life, it's not to be on stuff. Uh, he says that when you, you fall in love with money, uh, it leads to destruction and perdition. Destruction means deadly to your soul. The, uh, the, the, and, and perdition means that your life is wasted. It's a word waste. Your life is wasted because you spend it on on nothing that's ever going to be of eternal value whatsoever. Isn't that something? Uh, and uh, and he says that you man of God flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, and meekness. Uh, do you know how valuable those attributes are? The world would pay any amount of money if they're not saved if they could buy those things and have them in their life uh, because they don't have them and they're always searching for them. These things are, are great gain. They're better than any amount of money or any place you'll ever go in your life. Are you agreeing with that? Okay, I hope so uh, because that's what he's talking about here. And, and your want list as a Christian, Paul talks about this, your want list as a Christian should be only for two things. Do you know what those are? Food and clothing. That's what God has promised that he will give us if we uh, follow him and do what he told us to. Now, Matthew 6, I put it in here. Uh, Therefore, take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewith shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth you have need of these things, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. And since Paul uh, wrote this and Paul believed this, his want list was very short. Mm -hmm. Clothing, food. Now I know you say, well, housing, we need a place to, to lay down. Our Lord, when he was here in his ministry, had no place to lay his head. Most of the prophets in the Old Testament didn't have a house to go back to. They, they were wondering and preaching and, and doing what God told them to. Now, I'm thankful for the, that God's never let me be without a house. Uh, I, I'm thankful for that. But if he decided not for me to have a place, a house, I am supposed to be content. And I would be content. See? Because it, it, dissatisfaction is not because of a situation, it's because of you. Uh, situations don't create dissatisfaction. Something in your life that, that some need, need that's not being met is what creates dissatisfaction. A and God will meet those needs. Uh, and, and it simply says here um, in the scriptures that when you get into seeking money, there'll be temptation, there'll be traps, there'll be senseless hurts and desires, and there'll be ruin and destruction in your Christian life. Love of money uh, causes people to err. And the Bible says err, and the, and the error means drift away. It doesn't mean you stand up and make a decision and say, I'm not going to follow Christ anymore. It means you get involved in these things and loving money and trying to make more money, and you just simply drift away. You just take step by step and get you away. I could tell you lots of illustrations, and all preachers could. I could tell you about Dick Bernhardt. When I was in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, Dick was a young married uh, man, and, and he was he had one of the best personalities of anybody you'd ever meet. He was just so happy all the time and always nice to be around. And he decided that he was going to make a lot of money, and he was going to give a lot to the Lord. We were in a building program, and he decided he'd help us pay for that building program. And I advised him, don't do this, but he didn't listen to me. Uh, and... He started, got involved with Amway. You remember the Amway pyramid situation? Uh, that is, Amway said, if you join us and you start selling our products, you can recruit other people to do the same, and, and you will get a percentage of what they sell, and you'll just keep building this up until you become, oh, you'll just make tons of money. But the problem was they had their motivational meetings every Sunday. And Dick started going to those motivational meetings instead of coming to the Lord's house where he was supposed to be. 
And I don't even need to tell you, you're mature adults in here, I don't even need to tell you what happened. You know what happened. He got away from the Lord. He got away from everything connected to the Lord. And when I left uh, Lancaster, Pennsylvania to go to New York, he was still away from the Lord. Couldn't get him back again. Just wasted his life. Uh, and it breaks your heart to see that happen to someone. But, but it happens all the time. Uh, we all have to have money in our society in order to function. But, but we don't need to love money. What do you love? Okay. Where is your love? Well, what's your treasure? My treasure is God. My treasure is the Lord Jesus Christ. Part of my treasure is the church. Uh, I treasure these things. This is where I spend my time and my money and my prayer life in these things. And that's what he's talking about here, um, that, that you need to be content uh, with what God has given you. And we all have to work for a living. That's okay. Uh, God designed it that way. But we do not need to get to the point that we just want more and more and more and more money. Because when we get to that point, our focus will be on the money rather than God. And it will lead us astray. Um, uh, the second point here is this, and I'm trying to watch the clock. If you're not satisfied with what you are and have already, you'll never be satisfied with what you want. Mm -hmm. that's, that's true. Uh, the book of Ecclesiastes, Solomon, the wise man, wrote in Ecclesiastes 5, 10 through 20, and I put it in here and had to uh, continue on the back of the, of the page to get it all in here, but he simply <coughs> said, He that loveth silver shall not be satisfied with silver, nor he that loveth abundance with increase. He said, this is vanity. And the word vanity there means a vapor or a breath. It means that this is something that's not substantial. Uh, the scripture says in James that our life is like a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes. My understanding of that is, uh, from what I've read, is in those days they had no way of measuring uh, breath. And when a person was so near death, his breathing was imperceptible to the human eye. They held a piece of polished metal over his mouth and nose, and as long as he was breathing, that little bit of, of moisture would create a vapor on that piece of metal, and when he drew his last breath, that vapor would disappear, and his life was over. And this is what he's talking about here. All of this is vanity. It disappears. Uh, somebody said money talks. You know what money says? Goodbye, goodbye. Uh, yeah, that's what it says to everybody. Uh, but it, it, you, no matter how much you accumulate in this life of material things, that's what he's saying here, and I won't read all of Ecclesiastes 5. You can on your own. He simply says that uh, some people uh, always eat after dark. And what he's talking about here is in that agricultural society, they worked long days and worked until it got completely dark before they ever went home instead of stopping at sunset as they were supposed to do and they spent all their time working, working, working trying to have more, more, and more and it came to nothing. He said the greatest blessing in Ecclesiastes chapter 5 the greatest blessing you can have is for you to enjoy what God has given you. You're to find enjoyment in what God has given you and give God thanks for what he's given you. In this passage, he says, if God gave you great riches, rejoice in that. But if he didn't give you much, rejoice in what you have and, and don't work yourself to death trying to have more. I know that goes against what uh, our society teaches us. We always have to have more and more and more. And I'm telling you, as an 80-year-old man, uh, the more you accumulate, the more you have to get rid of when you get to be 80 years old. Uh, you just have to start discarding this stuff. We're taking stuff to goodwill and something almost every week. But I decided a long time ago, I'm not buying anything new if what I have now still functions. See, uh, I'm not giving it up just because a newer model came out. Uh, I, I, that's true with my wife, and she's not in here, so I can say that. <laughs> that that's, true with, that's true with everything that, that I'm a part of. I decided that. I don't need something new all the time to satisfy me. And this is what he's talking about. The person who's not content with what God's already given will never be satisfied by having more. 
That's right. The more of the same. Uh, I put in here, Japanese have a proverb which says, a man who sleeps in a thousand mat room can only sleep on one mat. Yeah. What do you do if you buy, if you have a house that has ten bedrooms? You can't sleep in but one. Why? Uh, and so uh, that we need to understand, we be content with what God has given us for the normal work that we do. Not killing ourselves at work, working as God intended for us to do, whatever we get, be content with that. Uh, I also put in here about the unchangeables in your life that I hope you're content with your parents. God chose them for you. Are you content? Uh, children, young people sometimes get exasperated and say, I wish I'd never been born. And I always tell them it's too late. Uh, it's, but, uh, you, and you can't change parents. The, the God gave you the parents he wanted you to have. God gave you your, your time in history. You were born at this point in history because God had a purpose for your life here and now instead of another time. He could have chosen another time. Your racial background, God chose that through your parents. Your national heritage, that brings some bonuses, some problems, especially right now in our nation as we're going through all this conflict. Uh, your gender, are you content with being a male or female and you dress and act accordingly? And I want to say this here. This fallacy that we're hearing promoted that, that God made somebody uh, a sodomite no. is absolutely wrong. No. God hates, in fact, sodomy is an abomination. Yeah. One of the things he calls an abomination. And he would never make you that way. You chose to be that way. You're not born an alcoholic. You choose alcohol. You see, all these things, and I could, I'll talk about that another time on a matter of next week, is about choices. As, uh, as uh, Joshua tells the people, choose you this day whom you're going to serve. We all make choices. I had a brother uh, who was an alcoholic, an older brother. I had a middle brother who became one following him. I never have a drink in my life. You make a choice. You don't have to be controlled by your by your family history or by your birth uh, people uh, that are before you? Are you content uh, with your birth order? Uh, the first, middle, and the last. Which one are you? Oh, I remember when we had three kids. Uh, and you know what that means when you have a car that only has two doors? How many of you are at that point that you have children that that's a problem with? Everybody wants to sit by the door, right? And so we finally got wisdom enough to say, there's a birth order here. God designed it. We didn't. And my t the two daughters, they were the oldest, could sit by the door until one of them got away from home and then our son could have a door to sit by. And that settled it. That's the only way to settle it. Every time we got in the car, it was a battle about that, you see. Are you content with your birth order? And, and each birth order has some unique characteristics. Uh, are, are you content about your physical features? Are you, you know, are you trying to change the way God made you as far as your physical appearance? I, I've never done that. I, old age is changing it on its own. But, but I never have been dissatisfied with the way God made me look. I, I never thought about having my nose made smaller or larger. Uh, some people thought I should have my tongue made smaller occasionally, uh, but I, but you you take what are you satisfied with how God made you physically? Are you satisfied with your mental abilities? Some people really have a high IQ. I do not. I've never had mine taken, but I think mine would be below average. But I've always made really good grades in school because I I learned how to be disciplined and how to study, how to do things. You don't have to be limited by your mental ability that you got at birth. You can, you can do a lot of things if you apply yourself and learn how to do it, right? I, of course, I told you when I was in college, I had a photographic memory, and I could read a page and bring it up for a test, but like I told you also, I, I ran out of film, uh, and that didn't last forever. Right now, I have to study, study, study to get these lessons together and, and, and to top them up. Uh, and But... You know, are you satisfied with the mental ability that God gave you? Use what he gave you. And then are you satisfied with your family's death time? Who decides when your mother, father, brothers, and sisters die? God does. Are you satisfied with that? And you're not fighting God about that and saying ugly things to God? 
because a parent died. My dad died before I was 10 years old. Uh, and my mom lived to be in her middle 90s. <coughs> but again, uh, are you satisfied with that? There was a purpose God had in that. And then your aging and death, and uh, your birth and, date and death dates are determined by God, of course. But I put in here, you do have a choice in getting older. Remember what we read when we were talking about being a, a, an older person uh, in one of the lessons, Psalm 20, uh, 92, 12 through 15? Uh, the righteous shall flourish like the palm tree. He shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon, and those that be planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. They shall bring forth fruit in old age. They shall be fat and flourishing. That's good news in case you're trying to lose weight. To show that the Lord is upright. He is my rock and there's no unrighteousness in him. Uh, the, the word here for, uh, it says that if you are a righteous person doing what God tells you to do, your life will still be fruitful when you get old. It says that you'll be like the, the palm tree, and the palm tree is the most unique tree in the world. The palm tree, the life of the palm tree is in the core. Uh, other, bur other types of, bur uh, bur of trees have the outside is where the life is. You cut down in through that first layer in a tree, and, and if you do that, the, the Early settlers call that girding tree. The tree will die because that's where the sap flows in the outer rings. Uh, the palm tree, the life of the tree, the sap, is in the center. And what happens on the outside does not affect the life on the inside. Plus, the palm tree does this, and I like it. Its fruit gets sweeter the older that it gets. You know what that means? You should be sweeter now than you've ever been in your life. Isn't that good? Don't you hate to run into an old person who is just, we used to call it cantankerous. I guess that's not a good word anymore. But it's just negative about everything they say. You can say, isn't it a good day? And they'll say, yeah, but yesterday was just awful. Uh, when you run into somebody like that, it just makes you want to forget about having a conversation with them. We are to be flourishing in our old age. If you're righteous, you have a choice to make about how you grow old. Yes. I'm more content and more uh, happy now than I've ever been in my life. Are you? Yeah, Boy, it'd be a shame if you look back and say, it was better back there. Yeah. No, it wasn't better back there. Uh, we were poor. Uh, we, we had no money at all. I'm telling you, we, you heard me talk about it. When I was in seminary, I lived on a quarter a day to spend. I bought a Pepsi to eat with my sandwich at work. That's all we had. I mean, we were on such a tight budget, that, and God was good. He never let anything come in to tear up the budget. Isn't God wonderful? Amen. See? And whenever we needed something that wasn't in the budget, God provided for it. And this is what he's talking about here. Are you content with your aging? Are you content with the day you're going to die? Now, I don't know when that's going to be, but I'm content thinking about it. I'm not afraid that I are you. No, sir. At least at this point, I'm not. I don't know how I'll react when it actually happens. Nobody knows that. But my determination is to die with a smile on my face. Mm -hmm. I hope I can die like Joseph did down in Egypt with my children around me on the bed, pointing out to them, this is what I want you to do. This is what you need to be. I hope I, I've been telling them all my life. I don't want to quit on my bed. Uh, but you see, I, are, are you content thinking about that? I am. It doesn't scare me. I mean, after all, I've got Psalm 23 that the Lord promised to go with me through it. I've got 1 Corinthians 15 that I'm going to get a new body that doesn't hurt anymore. I'm going to, all of that. So I'm not afraid. In fact, sometimes when I wake up and, and I hurt a bit, I kind of look forward to that. Do you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know. If you're 18 years old, we don't think about it. <laughs> but the, the, the unchangeables. Uh, and then uh, the third thing here, and Tom will run out, you must give up earthly possessions to have eternal treasures. That is, uh, 2 Corinthians 4, 16 through 18 says, uh, that although our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day for a light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a more exceeding and eternal weight of glory, 
while we look not at the things that are seen, but the things that are not seen, for the things that are seen are temporal, but the things that are not seen are eternal. And God made you like you are, placed you where he wanted you to be because he wants you to have eternal life and eternal treasure. But in order to have eternal treasure, you have to give up things here. You have to give up time, attention, money, all those things you have to sacrifice in order to have eternal things. You cannot have them both. If you spend all your time seeking earthly things, you have no you have no eternal things. On the day when you stand before the Lord and he judges you according to your works, not according to your salvation, that's been settled, but he'll judge you according to your works. If you worked all your life for stuff, you'll have nothing. If you worked for him, at least a good part of your life has been devoted to him, you'll have great rewards. The scripture tells us so. So where you land up your treasures? What's most valuable to you? Is your treasure pleasing God? See, uh, that's, that's what I, I'm hoping I'm doing. But the whole key question is this. What's the most important thing in your life? Paul said in Philippians uh, 3, 7 through 11, What things were gained to me, these I counted loss for Christ. Yet doubtless I count all things for loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things. Paul is our example here. Uh, the Lord is our primary example, but Paul is our uh, secondary example of a human being who really gave his life to the Lord and used his life for the Lord all of those years. See? And the thing God's trying to get us to see, that if, if you're unhappy, uh, it's because you're not letting God make you happy. There's no reason for anyone to go on unhappy as a Christian. God will give you contentment if you seek it. Uh, after all, what would you do with more if you're not satisfied with what you have now? If money doesn't satisfy you now, what you, what you have now and how you spend it satisfies you, why would more make you more satisfied? It really won't. You buy bigger stuff. But that still won't make you happier. Besides, what are the problems in your life primarily devoted to? Stuff you own. Uh, I've, sometimes I've, I want to throw my computer against the wall. Uh, and I never have. I haven't beat it. But sometimes when, it, when the internet goes out or the computer crashes or all those things, think of all the stuff you go through. And if you lose your cell phone, your life is over. Right, I mean, you know, you. Uh, I, I'm not a cell phone guy. I finally, my daughter made me take one when I cracked my hip in the yard and had to go to rehab. And she said, "Dad, I was alone. Uh, Virginia was in Texas with our daughter, uh, helping her with some things at her house, and uh, having a mother-daughter time." Uh, and she said, "I never want you to do that again." And I hate that thing. Uh, our son installed a ring on our front porch. Uh, the other day for me. He thought it would just make me real happy. He has one at his house. And all that thing does is, in the middle of the night, if the wind blows too hard, it makes a sound on my phone and wakes me up out of sound sleep. Uh, and I've turned the thing down so low that it won't work anymore. Uh, I, again, I'm thankful that we have stuff, but stuff doesn't make you happy. It does not. What makes you happy? God makes you happy. It's, and he calls it joy. What would the world give to have love, joy, peace, mm -hmm. patience, kindness, self-control, all those things that are the fruit of the Spirit? What would they give if they could have those things? And you and I have them. Where do we get them? As a gift from God. We already have the greatest gain we could possibly have in our life. We have eternal life through Jesus. And we have everything we need for to please God in this life. I know sometimes it's hard for us to be content, but God says be content with what you have. The only person that ought to ever be discontented all the time is a lost person. They ought to be discontented. They know something's lacking in their life, and they ought to be, they, they should be discontented until they finally realize that eternal life is what you're seeking for, not physical stuff in this world.
and come to him. And I hope that if you're not saved, you will be dissatisfied with uh, your life until you come to God and give it to him, and then you'll be content. But listen, be content with God's choices. Don't ever be content with your spiritual growth. You hear me? I hope the day I die, I grow a little bit more mature and more like my Lord that day before I die. Don't you? I want to be more like him. Uh, don't be content with your spiritual life, how, how mature you are. There's always more that you need to do to be mature with the Lord. But don't be dissatisfied with what God's given you. That's terrible. Uh, how would you feel, and I'm watching the clock, how would you feel if you're a parent and you gave your best gift to your child and they said, that's not enough? What would you call that child? The most ungrateful child on earth. I wonder sometimes what my father thinks of me with what he's given me that sometimes I think I need more than what he's given me. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this lesson. Thank you for all the way back in the Old Testament. Your people were satisfied with what you gave them. Help us to be that way too. But Father, we have a challenge ahead of us. We, you've given us some things, but you've told us you do want to give us more. And so I pray you'll help us today, help our pastors who preach us to us, help us that we'll have faith that if you want us to do more than we're doing now, you want us to, to do something new to, to advance this church of the kingdom, that you'll give us the faith and the commitment to do it. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.